This is not the story anymore. Right? We have powerful computers anywhere. <laughs> so why? Look, Google managed to, to serve you searches without downloading search index to your site. You don't need to download the whole inter internet indexes in order to find something. Google manages to serve searches from the server side. So, why we still have to download search indexes for Maven? When you use Maven, your tool needs to download search indexes. Why? Well, this is why. Summertime donated a standard of repository search we built on the search indexes. So now let's see how good is it. First of all, you have to download huge files before you can search anything. They are updated very rarely. Well, they are updated once in 24 hours, but new packages come in every minute or two, so this is rare. It requires a special client. You cannot just search for a package from Eclipse. You need the Eclipse to support this kind of uh, search uh, index API. The same with IntelliJ. It requires a special client. Well, not the best idea. So, <laughs> it wasn't their best donation. Opposite to Maven, naturally, which is very good. Sometimes. Well, we have some uh, tools that work with searches, other tools work, uh, with search indexes, other tools work without search indexes. So those are actually much better. Devin and RPM, they have a good excuse. They are old tools. They used searches when the servers were big and slow. Lesson learned, index on the server side, expose query API. This is how you do searches. Story number two. This story is about impostors. Who knows who this guy is? Henry Heine. <laughs> Who is Henry Heine? <laughs> Who is Henry Heine? Henry Heine was a poet. He was born in German and lived and died in France um, like a long time ago. Yes. Ooh, approximately. Yeah. Now, this is a PGP public key server, trustedtimestamping.com, which means that you sign something with your PGP signature, and then this server, this server can actually promise that whatever signed is signed by the man who actually wrote it. Okay, so far I can go there with some PGP signature and ask who is this guy and I look at I know for sure this is Henry Heine. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like a lot of Henry Heine. <laughs> there are some very smart guys. HenryHeine.com.de uh, yeah. and Wolfgang Mozart and, uh, you know, uh, most of them are higher kind. <laughs> Trusted server. True story. So, uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so here's the answer. You have this um, Linux utility for generating keys. And this utility has defaults that you, you know, you just can click over. You enter, 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 enter for details. And this is the default for name and email. <laughs> <laughs> it's because this uh, tool was written in Düsseldorf University, which named an, an, uh, after Mannerheim. Uh, this is a nice story, but this is what people do when they need to deploy their Java package to Maven Central. They are going to do this: we 
PGP generate key and they are going to enter and enter all through this forum and most of the Java packages in Maven Central are probably written by Henry Heinz. <laughs> is broken. <coughs> well, here is a story number two and a half. Yeah, it's a sad story. This guy cut his ear off and died unappreciated. So, what we can learn from these two stories, one and a half, we should authenticate by public identity, not by some cryptic PGP key that turns to be hungry kindness. And we need to give credit to the developer to prevent more accidents like one go. So we can kill two birds with one stone by doing something like that. This is Nougat. Nougat is a dependency management, is a modular system for .NET. And this is how the package descriptions looks like. So we have this name and everything. And look here. It has credited contributors, owners, authors, etc. etc. So we actually achieved both targets here. First of all, we know who did it. Okay? It's not some PGP cryptic key that turns out to be an Anna. And the developer <coughs> receives the credit that he deserved. Right? So this guy knows, okay, this is me, it's nice, kind of, I would like to have some a, uh, you know, maybe votes or maybe a, a reviews, but uh, whatever. So, um, this is plug. And this is shameless plug. <laughs> and now we have three sides of shameless plug. This is Bintray. Bintray is a software distribution platform from JFrog. It's totally free. Uh, it's open for everybody. All of you can just join in tomorrow. What's interesting about Pintray is that we hope we learn from all the lessons that I'm going to talk here. So here you can see exactly what I'm talking about. The developer appreciation and uh, the public identity. You can know for sure that Griffon was written by Andres. It's awesome uh, library, by the way. Uh, Groovy, uh, Swing, JavaFX, all the good stuff are in. Uh, never mind. So you can you can know that it's Andres, and you can thank him for developer appreciation, right? So this is the idea. Builder now supports many packages, RPMs, Debians, more along the way. I'm done with the shameless plug, and we can continue uh, and uh, have some laugh about some uh, stupid stories. Story number three. Well, this is story number three. We want to install some software in our operation system, big Windows or whatever. And here, look, when we are going to install this software, it has no version in the installation method app. So usually we don't care because this is a self-contained software. It's not a module for anything else. But this is not always the case. Because if the version is not listed, no others can depend on it. Right? Or how can they know which version they depend on? Now, this uh, is not a story only for Windows self-contained packages, but look, this is a real dependency tree for a tool named apt. Who knows what apt is? Good. This is something that's very into modular. Apt is a system for installing modules on a Debian-based uh, Linux. And this app, you can see, a lot of packages depend on it, directly or indirectly. But they depend on app without version. And this is a problem because where is no version there, we have to bring Boromir. <laughs> <laughs> this is the problem because if you have one app without version installed in your system, you cannot have another app installed in your system because you don't have version. So, this is a problem not only with apt, of course, but here is something closer to your programming experience. You want to have two versions of Ruby installed. How can you do that? 
Well, there are some workarounds, like Ruby version manager, which actually installs you Ruby in a different way than original uh, uh, packages manager. Uh, this package, uh, this tool can install it with versions. So actually, a way to install module without version is to install it differently with version. Because if you don't have version, you just cannot install multiple versions of. Well, this problem of a single namespace, version collisions, is a big problem all across the board. So we have it on the system level, and this is uh, what we saw, cannot use multiple versions. The update updates all of them and everything. We have it for RPMs, like with Zapt, we have it with Groovy, we have it with Ruby, and we have our workarounds like a Ruby version management, Groovy version manager, and uh, in the case of Mac, we have a whole new packaging system for an entire operation system to fight this problem, the homebrew. If you uh, work on Mac, you probably uh, know it. Uh, we have the same platform level. We have this class path hell because uh, from a JVM class loader point of view, it, uh, it doesn't know the notion of different versions of the same file, of the same class. If I happen to have the same class twice in class path, Java will pick up the first, even if the other one should be just another version of it. We don't have this notion built in in Java. And the same is true for DLLs, right? With DLL and L, you have this file, <laughs> DLL file, you cannot know which version is it. And here, um, another example, of course, this is the transitive dependency context. Uh, the workaround in Java, it's the Uber jar or jar jar, uh, another name for it. You just take and put all the classes under your jar to fight this story of transitive dependencies um, conflict, which I have a nice uh, anecdote to tell you just afterward. In, the, uh, in native world, you just uh, do study compilation and combine them all together to fight it, right? So, um, talking about uh, transitive dependency conflicts in uh, Java, here's a nice interval for you. So, uh, who knows how manager, uh, maintenance conflict manager works? Yeah, I knew, I knew that one, and this is what I expected. He will be the only one. Good. So you will, uh, you will enjoy, all the rest will enjoy. Well, I have my package uh, version A, and I have E package version, uh, sorry, version 1, E package version 1, D package version 1, and B package version 1. Some more packages, and look, I have a conflict here. Well, transitive dependencies, same package, different versions. Now let's play who wants to be a millionaire. This is one million question, the last one. Which version of D ends up in the class pass? Who thinks it will be D1? Uh, I'll go back right here. Who thinks it will be D1? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Who thinks it will be D2? It doesn't think so. All the rest don't want to be known. Okay. <laughs> there are four answers in your quiz. Yeah, there are four answers in my quiz. Ah, okay. You want to, rest, to talk about the rest? Who thinks both? Okay, nice. Who thinks none of them? Let's call a friend. <laughs> you call a friend. Good. So I will answer for you. Okay, so I would say, being your honest friend, that D2 is the reasonable choice. When I didn't specify any particular strategy for resolving the dependency, I would expect that the higher version will be selected, assuming that if it has backwards compatibility, I'm good. Right? Yeah, right. If not, I'm in trouble, but I'm already in trouble. So I just want to, uh, to hope that 80% of the cases will go. Well, so I would suppose it's D2 and you will take my answer and we will lose all the money because the right answer is D1. Uh, the reason it's D1 is also ridiculous. The reason it's D1 because 
inclusion, exclusion of a specific version is made it's very painful. There is a nicer workaround just to specify the version that you want to use in your top level POM. Which means that whatever version is closer to your top level POM will be chosen. So here, just because the D1 is closer to the root, it will be taken. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's a great tool for sometimes. Well, okay. Uh, you missed Bormir? Here we come again. Uh, once we are into all this installation of the versions and everything, we have a problem with cache managers. So there are very <coughs> naive cache managers. For example, Maven Cache, your local Maven 2 repository, it's straightforward, right? It goes like you have this uh, tree, it's very, very simple. And if you want to uninstall some module, just delete the jar. You just go and delete the jar. Well, this is not the story in smarter cache managers. So here we have some cache manager from some very smart tool to announce what the local cache uh, looks like for which tool. Oh, this is great, actually. So here we have checksum storage. You see, the file store contains files under their checksums. And this is a very good idea for various reasons I won't mention now. And now, look, here is another folder for the same NTLR277. And here is another folder. This was artifact 14. This is artifact 8. And here is another jar. It looks the same. Checksum. Well, when I need to delete NTLR from my local cache, I have no clue where to go. Because this is very smart stuff, but it doesn't have useful API. I cannot go and say I want to remove NTLR A277. And uh, uh, the lesson that should be taken from here, and uh, we are not there, for example, Gradle still doesn't have a decent uh, cache manager, is that we actually need a cache manager. I need a tool in which I can say, okay, clean the cache, or clean this group ID, or clean this artifact ID, or something like that. We, uh, we don't have it uh, for now. Um, okay, next one is about the version ranges. Sometimes I want to say, well, version 3 and that is good for me. Who thinks it's a good idea? No, okay, so um, we have, uh, in JFork we have one of our, uh, two of our three founders are extremely uh, techy guys. They are like, I don't know, like gods for all the rest of us in terms of Java and architecture and everything. And this is the, their biggest point of disagreement. One of them thinks that version ranges are super cool. The other thinks the, the version ranges is very dangerous. This is true. It's super cool, but very dangerous. Well, okay. So, version ranges actually means that we assume that everything is backwards compatible. When I say my code is written for working with version 3, but probably version 5 will work. Also, I assume that version 5 is backwards compatible. Well, probably version 5 will be, but there are chances that it won't. Where the version ranges are good, when we are talking about small ranges. Minor fix or minor version, I can assume it could be backwards compatible in much higher a feeling of assurance that the manager version. So, well, it's not always that. And then stuff suddenly stops working. Right? So I have my code, I have my build, I build it today, I build it tomorrow. The same build, my code didn't change, and the code breaks now. Why? Because some Maven plugin introduced uncompatible changes and increased the version, and now I get it and it won't work. So, Depend explicit dependency versions are the safe choice. Minor version ranges is cool, but starting to be dangerous. As bigger the version range is, the, the most dangerous uh, it becomes. So, 
If you want to be real on the safe side, just require explicit dependency versions. Now, this is a lesson that Maven, for example, learned. If you remember Maven 2, the plugins by default came with latest resolution strategy, which means we have a new version of the plugin. Let's bring it to our new build. And of course, builds suddenly stop working or start to behave differently. Maven 3, all the plugins are nailed to their explicit versions. This is a lesson that um, they learned and we learn through that. Wait, sorry about that. Yeah. Story number five, you are going to love this one. <laughs> yeah, there are things in the world that doesn't mix. This, it's actually not Russian-oriented audience because otherwise this is not a good idea for something that doesn't match, right? Of course it mix. You get much out of it. <laughs> but yeah, when, I, when you come to the States, this is something that you can safely say. It doesn't, it doesn't mix. Well, anyway, configure metadata won't mix even in Russia. That's for sure. And in Ukraine too. Uh, what do I mean by mixing config and metadata? Um, take your POM file, for example. In your POM file, you have two things mixed together. You have the configuration of your build, and you have the metadata about your uh, model. But they are different, because metadata configuration is a source, is part of the knowledge how your product should be built. So here we look at GitHub, where we keep our sources, and there is a build of Gradle here which describes how this build should be built. When metadata about the package, for example, list of its dependencies, it's a part of the package itself. It should be a metadata which is attached to your jar file. So maybe you really have a binary repository, the jar is in it, and the POM should be with it. Inside POM, we have the transit dependencies. And this is the same package. It contains both the POM and Gradle script. Gradle script describes how the product should be built, and this is your configuration. And the POM file describes what is the metadata, what are the dependencies, and this is part of your binary distribution. When you mix them, strange things <laughs> happen. So you had your project, and it was a good one, and it was very happy. And you asked your dependencies to come only from your trusted binary repository. You have your in-house binary repository, you configure your POM, your settings, etc., you know, whatever, to work just with this repository only, and then it looks that you are safe. All your dependencies come from a trusted source. And then you add a dependency. The same B1 from the story area. This is the same uh, dependency. The problem is now, oh, okay, so far so good. You get this V1 from your trust repository. But inside the metadata of B1, when B1 declares its own transitive dependency, B1 also has part of the configuration where the transitive dependency should come from. You see, it has a repository declaration inside metadata. And this is a very bad idea, because now we introduce a bad repository into our build because those declarations of repositories are now mixed together. And now you will have dependencies coming from the bad repository, because metadata and settings were merged together inside the project. The good repository was shortcutted and the transitive dependencies of B1 will come from untrusted source. Not fun. Where are we standing with time? Okay, good. We have... Yeah, so don't mix configuration and metadata. Go and mix what can you do. Uh, last story. Story number six. 
I think it's last, we will see. Which, which watch, which watch? When I need Elasticsearch plugin for grades, which version of plugin for which version of Elasticsearch works with which version of grades? <laughs> <laughs> this is a true story. Winter again is written in grades with Elasticsearch plugin. So, we know this thing. What we need is matrix. Not this kind of matrix, but this kind of matrix. I wish we had a way to express not just dependency, but a good dependency configuration matrix that will be clear which version of which works with what. We don't have it good enough in Java community. The only tool in Java community that knows how to do configuration matrix is who knows? <laughs> OSGI. Now there is no way I'm going to say a good word about OSGI in my presentation. <laughs> I just did, right? Yeah. That's okay. No more. And the way Java community and every other pluggable uh, ecosystem should do it is the way that RPM does it. RPM is a modular tool for Red Hat Linuxes and uh, Fedora and CentOS and some others. This is what they have. This is actually a descriptor of dependency in RPM. Look how richer it is comparing to what we have in Java world, in Maven and Gradle or whatever. We have this notion of obsolete, the notion of conflicts, except of the request. Well, the request is the only we have. The prerequisites, etc., etc. Now, here with this standard, I can explicitly um, say my needs of the dependency. I can say the Gradle plugin, uh, excuse me, the Elasticsearch plugin works with such version of Grails and obsolete or deprecate other version of plugin and etc. etc. And we can uh, then see the version ranges here, etc. etc. So this is actually the good way to describe a dependency, and here we have some version ranges which, as we mentioned, should be very, very limited, but uh, could exist if you are sure enough. Well, okay. Now, the lesson that we learned that uh, version dependency isn't enough, and we need to support dependency matrix, right? Uh, that's all, no more stories. Uh, just one more thing. Um, we're going to have more modulars. Uh, systems. And the reason we are going to have more modular uh, systems is because of the cloud. And how is that connected, if you ask? Very simple. Once we have good cloud repositories, good cloud platforms for managing modules, developing a modular system becomes really easy. Think about it now, you need to develop a pluggable application. The first pain you are going to encounter after you finish with that is how the heck I'm going to host all the plugins that my huge community is going to produce. And this is the pain, for example, uh, now uh, filled by Gradle, which is a very popular build tool, gaining momentum, gaining popularity, more and more plugins are uh, uh, developed and they don't have decent plugin repository. They just don't. Other example is Grails. Grails do have decent plugin repository, but they have invent, uh, uh, they invested huge amount of effort in developing it instead of developing uh, Grails. Right? Well, you know, we have limited resources. And uh, you can think uh, by yourself about examples of great tools that could benefit good plugin repository. So now we have cloud solutions for that, 
and which means that uh, people can uh, take this burden off their shoulders and say, okay, there is no problem, I'm going to develop good pluggable architecture, I will take all the takeouts from those uh, painful lessons, I will do a great job now in terms of all the problems that I mentioned earlier, and the hosting won't be a problem. There are places where to host my plugins. Well, this is it. And uh, I was in so much hurry to uh, finish all the slides that I actually finished them earlier, uh, which is a good thing because now we have a couple of minutes for your questions if you have any. Come on. Now, ask me about things. Yeah. It's uh, so, okay, so uh, um, for your idea, what's the best package management system? <laughs> <laughs> well, there is no one uh, actually best package management system. Uh, you, you saw that the examples, uh, which are examples of the good uh, things, are examples of the bad things in others. For example, RPM does a great job in terms of matrix compatibility expression, but they work with downloadable search indexes. Right? And uh, uh, Gradle, for example, they do very smart stuff in how they cache the binaries, but it doesn't have a, a cache manager and they don't have decent plugin repository. So the, there is no uh, tool that I can go through uh, all the examples and say this excels in that, in that, in that, and in that. Everybody, everyone has its advantages and disadvantages, which means that you are, going, you are the one who is going to deliver the first ever perfect pluggable and your architecture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Is there any uh, good practices uh, balancing between uh, models and config and metadata? Yes, sure, it's very simple. There are uh, very strict rules what is metadata and what is config. Metadata is basically the credentials of the tool that you do, which means if we are going to talk about naming terms, it's a group ID, artifact ID, version, and all the metadata that comes with it, authors, licenses, a version control, issue tracker, etc., etc., metadata, right? Information about your uh, binary. All the rest, which means how to, how to build on where to take the, uh, the configuration from, etc., etc. This is the configuration and it should be a part of your source because this is how you build your package, it's not a part of your package. Another question. Sure. Are there any evidence that scenario is moving forward uh, uh, counting this? Uh... Yeah, sure, it's very simple. Uh, I think a year ago they are publicly admitted in their blog that uh, allowing repositories in Pong logic use mistake, and they ask the community not to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there is a better way, actually. Um, um, it will be a little bit of shameless plug again because you asked, and this question wasn't planned or something, I, I swear. Um, uh, if you take an uh, artifactory binary repository from JFrog, Artifactory can clean up your bombs and throw away the uh, repository declaration out of it. So, uh, then, not your bombs, the third party bombs that come in. So, the resolution of those bombs won't shortcut your repository. And yeah. What, what's wrong in the is the Oh! <laughs> okay, so you got me started. Uh, well, OSGI is, is of course a wonderful idea and it's something very needed in the Java community. My, the only issue I have with OSGI, and which means everything for me, it's, it's real by far over complicated on what they should have been concentrating on. So the only thing I need when we talk about logability in class pass hell and everything is just let me determine the class pass module. This is the only thing I need. Right? And it could be done very, very easily, like other tools in the market do it, for example, JBoss modules. But OSGI is everything. Is services, is loading, uh, you know, it's loading order, it's the whole new package, packaging of bundling, etc., etc. And it all comes with huge and ugly descriptors. For me and for a lot of people, it feels like it should be too. 
my my is always to simplify this like the EGP was sure sure if the OSGI MG will be as great as OSGI 3 I'm the first adopter I swear <coughs> but for now it really feels EGP 2 okay. yep so, uh, usually there are a lot of uh, things with licensing uh, licensing things of different yeah. libraries yes and uh, so for example uh, sometimes you are uh, resolving such a thing as uh, so-called Oracle free licensing or uh, those Oracle licenses they are such a pain uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, your manager comes to you and asks uh, please give me a list of uh, free licenses and uh, non-free licenses and we should move uh, our dependencies only to such such and that kind of licenses so uh, do, do you uh, expect such kind of uh, problems uh, by your own or are there any tools or some best practices? Yeah, okay, sure. now I have no choice to prove this question wasn't planned. No, okay, now you got me, you got me in trouble because everybody will think that we actually uh, planned it in advance. <coughs> Talking about antivactory again. Uh, when you use a good binary repository, I won't state the name. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, um, we can analyze the package and decide which license is it. It can be from the metadata inside the package, right? Like the license taking the pom. It could come from other sources uh, of this information. For the, uh, for example, Black Duck Code Center. If you are familiar, if you are enterprise. Uh, you are familiar with that, and uh, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> uh, so, um, during the build process, we can go to this source of licensing, ask it what the license is, and then we can uh, do the rules which is allowed and which is not, get the reports, emails, everything, ban unwanted licenses, or warn about those unwanted licenses, etc. So, this piece is actually taken care of during the build of your module that analyzes all the, all the dependencies and everything. So yes, there is a good answer for that and it exists today. Yes? So, after so many parts. Uh, okay, uh, JFrog uh, developed good artifactory. Why not good Maven client? I mean, uh, Maven client? Well, Maven is client. Okay, another client that should sell like my own uh, from Artifactory. I mean, uh, some uh, some tools like Gravel or my own client or something yeah. that uh, could avoid all that it was and just work like Artifactory. Sorry for uh, yeah, we are we, we are very strongly believers in uh, uh, Gradle. Yeah, we, we, we definitely believe that this is the state of the art build tool as of today. It's of course not perfect as no software in the world is perfect and it has some downsides and once the Gradleware uh, from the help from the community realize those problems, they are fixed. But this is a huge step forward in terms of project automation and building software and, uh, and this is not our domain. And they do such a great job. Just use Gradle. Really, this is uh, this is my true advice. As uh, having some experience with building Java and automating Java project for the last uh, ten years, and uh, uh, yeah, use Gradle. It's great. Yeah. Uh, if you have a lot of uh, cash of uh, uh, libraries, you can build without internet. Uh, if, if you use our best uh, solution. Uh, well, it's actually the same. For today, you also don't have your Maven cache, uh, you know, just landing on your machine when you install your operating system. You download, uh, if you're with Maven, you download the internet once. If you're with Gradle, you download your dependencies once. But you have to have online connection to, do, to, to resolve your dependencies. So there will be a lot of cache. Uh, sure, of course. Because this, none, none of the stuff that we are working uh, that we spoke about is a new, you know, like a new uh, local manager, local cat manager. Those are all existing tools and they are.